Good morning, Whetstone family. It is so good to have you all here today that we can worship on this special Palm Sunday. Um, let's take a second and say hi to someone you hadn't had a chance to this morning. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, as you're as you're finding your seats, some of our announcements for this week. Tomorrow on uh, tomorrow evening on Monday, we have the Cub Scouts will have their blue and gold banquet. So you are, are certainly welcome to join them with that. Terry, would you like to say anything more about the blue and gold banquet? Um, yeah, I got this choir last Sunday. Uh, tomorrow night is their annual uh, Blue and Gold Banquet. It's for awards, and we have some other things going on, but there's a meal involved, and they just want to make sure that the Blue and Gold Banquet is actually sure uh, families that might come. So instead of I'm saying we get 25 extra people there, but it'd be nice to kind of give them an idea if we've got another dozen people coming from the church. Nice. Okay. Nice sure, absolutely. Six thirty. Yep. So six thirty tomorrow evening over here at the gym, the the Boy Scouts will be having their annual uh, uh, blue and gold banquet. They'll get their badges and awards. It's really a fun time uh, for the kids. There also will be a meal involved, so they'll feed you if you come. So uh, it's always good to support our, our scouting program. All right, so it looks like no heart for kids this week. They're on spring break. On Thursday, we have our special Monday Thursday service. That'll be over in the gymnasium. So uh, please join us for that. And then uh, next Sunday is our special Easter celebration. We'll be uh, having a breakfast, a sunrise breakfast down in uh, uh, the basement, we'll be having a, a casserole, a breakfast casserole uh, breakfast. Yep. Nice so, so uh, yeah, and no Sunday school. So bring your bring your appetites. Bring your appetites. All right. Are there any other announcements that I might have uh, missed this morning? Yes. Uh, Good Friday service. Oh yeah. Uh, what's the name of the church? New purpose on Dewey Street. Okay. I've never heard of it or seen it where that is. <laughs> All right. All right. So, yeah, there you go. If you'd like to go to a, a Good Friday service, uh, they'll be having, having that. Any other announcements? If not, any praises that you would like to share this morning, ways you have seen God working in your life. Pastor Steve. I'm glad to be here today. Yes. I feel invited for it last week. I really like it. Glad to be here today for the work there. Well, we're glad to have you here as well. Thank you. Yeah. I'm glad to be back too. I got had a short trip to New Mexico to see um, Joe was working a play and two of my friends were there. And it was awesome, but quick. And today, Ron, I've been here for many days. Very good. Very good. Terry. I had to from the gentleman that I spoke of last week. My five pastor. He is at home now. He's returned to his age group. Wonderful. Wonderful. Very good. Wow. Well, well, we do. <laughs> right. Well, good. Well, well, good. Becky. I like to I have to see my family yesterday at home and for Easter dinner with my daughter. Okay. Very good. Very good. Peggy. I'm thankful for a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's doing okay. He went back to work. Okay. Uh, I think he still has his heart monitor or something. So far, hopes on 
Um, also, Julie had to have more skin cancer removed from her leg. Okay. Spot on her arm, which is on the dermatology. Right? Yeah. Um, she's tolerated the night of her scent and came on. And she had this week off. She was cycle. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, also, my husband finally finished the plumbing problem in my house. <laughs> <laughs> we have a toilet for now. <laughs> well, good. <Yay>. Well, good. <laughs> that, that is a good thing. I Denise. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you finished? Yeah. Okay, I didn't want to interrupt you. Oh, no. My, uh, my daughter, my husband, did that. Okay. Uh, and then I had a lot of and her and her and her and her and her okay. Well, good. <laughs> well, glad they had a safe trip out here. So we'll pray for them to have a safe trip home. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's a lot of fun. That's a lot of fun. Uh, any other praises this morning? We've got a lot. Yeah. You woke up this morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we, we are so glad you're here. Uh, any other praises? Well, if not, <clears throat> um, there was a little boy who was sick on Palm Sunday and wasn't able to go to church, and his mom stayed at home with him. His dad went ahead and went to the service, and when he got home, he had uh, a palm branch. And so the little boy asked, you know, well, where, where did the palm branch come from? And and so his dad said, well, they, they told us that Jesus came into town and everybody was waving palm branches, so they gave us a palm branch. So the little boy thought for a moment and he goes, you would know it, the Sunday I wasn't there, Jesus shows up. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that first Palm Sunday, they welcomed Jesus by laying palm branches in their, their cloaks uh, before him. It was something intimate and personal for them. Um, and it's something that we should uh, look to as well. We need to lay down something intimate and personal in our worship of the Lord. And we can do that by laying our lives down, our burdens and our concerns. And when we do, that opens us up to invite him to have a triumphal entry into our heart. And it reminds me of the hymn, um, He is Here. He is here, listen closely, hearing calling out your name. He is here, you can touch him, and you will never be the same. Let us focus on that this morning as we prepare our hearts for worship, that he is here, and we can touch him. <laughs>
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us, Let us wave the palm branches high. Jesus is coming. Open wide the gates of your hearts. Let the Savior enter. May he claim us this day and heal our hearts. Shout with joy, all you people. Hosanna, blessed is he, us the name of the Lord. This morning, I um, was thinking uh, all the beauty um, that I didn't even recognize as I came in. I didn't look. The flowers, the trees, um, everything's coming forth, and you made it all. Um, so as we go home tonight, let's look around. Look at what he gave us, and we have dominion over it all. And think maybe on how we're using that. And uh, help us in all three, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, to help us uh, have a better life and really uh, appreciate what's out there for us and what we can do. Do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing for our opening hymn, My Savior's Love. You want to come up? <clears throat> All right, guys. So today is Palm Sunday. I'm sure you guys have probably learned a little bit about that already. But it was basically a big celebration for the coming of Jesus. So, um, 
going to go over the story really quickly with you. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus was with his disciples, and they were traveling, and they were coming towards the city of Jerusalem. But as they got there, they asked for a donkey to ride, so that Jesus could ride on the donkey. So they went, and the disciples got it, and they brought it back for Jesus, and he entered Jerusalem on the donkey. And as he got in there, he, uh, all the town was there waiting for Jesus, and they waved palm branches. Do you know what that is? Well, if you look behind you, there's some right there, but there are these giant um, leaves that they waved and waved for Jesus, um, kind of like how a cheerleader would shake for a football game or a basketball game. Yeah, I promise. That's right. <clears throat> and so, as we are getting to Easter, um, it's important to remember how they celebrated Jesus, and that's how we need to celebrate Jesus, too. <laughs> All right. You guys want to pray with me? Dear God, we celebrate today just as those people in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and we will be glad. Amen. Amen. I have a poem I'd like to share with you. I did not write this poem, just to be clear, uh, about Palm Sunday. The Triumphal Entry. In the quiet chambers of the soul, where shadows linger and doubts take hold, a king approaches, riding lowly yet grand. His robe of mercy brushes against the sand. Hosanna, the hearts cry out, as palms of surrender are strewn about. The crowd within, the hopes, the fears, yearns for salvations, eyes brimming with tears. He comes not on a war horse, but a donkey's back. His throne not earthly, but hearts he seeks to crack. The stones remain silent, the Pharisees dismayed, for this king brings redemption, not a sword's blade. Lift the gates, O heart, let him enter in, the one who bore our sins, our deepest sin. His love, a banner unfurled, flutters in the breeze, as he rides towards our brokenness, our soul's disease. Hosanna, we cry, our voices raised, not for earthly kingdoms, but for grace unchained. He dismounts not to a throne, but to a cross, where love's triumph is etched, where hope is embossed. So let him take his entry, unwavering and true, into the temple of your being, where shadows once grew. Lay down your cloaks of pride, your branches of acclaim, for the king of all kings seeks to bear your name. Hosanna! Let it echo through your days, as Jesus rides into your heart's crowded maze. His triumphal entry a love story divine, where grace meets brokenness and redemption shines. Thank you, Brian, again. Let us pray for our offering. <clears throat> Faithful Father, thank you for the gifts that you give us that are abundant and eternal. You have said that you are a good father who gives good gifts and your generosity overflows us. Everything that we have is a gift from you. And we, as we bring these offerings to you, we bring back to you from the abundant blessings that you have given to us. May your gifts be acceptable. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight to your honor and glory. We give it to you in Jesus name. Amen. All right. We do have a few prayer requests this morning. Uh, we certainly want to remember Adrian Orbal, um, who's in the hospital. Um, she had uh, a tumor on her spine that they had to do surgery uh, on, and uh, the the whole Orbal family needs our our prayers. Uh, she's in stable condition right now, but uh, continued prayers for her. And then uh, Marcy Marshall. Um, Sandy had asked for uh, prayer for her as she's recovering from, from surgery. The surgery went well, but I want to pray for her recovery. Um, are there any other prayer requests we'd like to bring? Terry. Uh, 
Herman, Mother in law of Frank Herman, Mother Mary. So, uh, Connie, Connie's uh, uh, mother-in-law, Mary, uh, we need to continue to pray for her. Ah. I want to pray for you, Rob. You're my favorite pastor. In the world. <laughs> I, I thought I thought that was Steve. Well, let's, let's say, and Steve here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Peggy, I thought I saw your hand. Um, my sister in law had her. She's had a lot of emotional and mental problems. Uh, also, for my brother in law, Harold, who has one more female in the hospital. All right, thank you, Peggy. Uh, anyone else? Karen. I was, yes. So we'll continue to pray for Hyla and her recovery. Becky. My brother-in-law, Okay. Uh, Dan. Pray for Ron going in for some tests on Wednesday. Absolutely. Anyone else? What if not? Let us go before our Lord in prayer. God of light and love and hope. We come before you this morning in awe and anticipation of your Spirit's leading. You are our wonderful and mighty God, our everlasting Father, and our Prince of Peace. We give thanks to you in, in your great mercy and compassion that you have shown to us. And how you sent your Son as a sacrifice that would redeem us from sin and bring eternal bring an eternal connection with you father we ask for you to enlighten our hearts that we may always be thankful for the grace and the comfort that you have shown us in our troubled times in our times of temptation father thank you that you have gathered us together as your church family we are strengthened and encouraged when we praise you together and to share in each other's joys and burdens and concerns. Father, there are many that are on our mind this morning, those that are in need emotionally and physically, those who are sick and lonely and weary, those who are lost and hurting, those that are mentioned and, and those that we have on our hearts and minds. Father, we continue to lift up Steve and pray for your continued healing uh, for him. We pray for strength and stamina in his body and in his faith. We continue to pray for Lynn we, we, and, and all caregivers, Lord. Encourage them and strengthen them. Father, we, we think of... Uh, we think of Mary and, and Jeff and Heather and Harold and Susie and Brad. Lord, we're thankful for the way that you have worked in their life already. We are thankful for the answered prayers that you have already answered. 
But Lord, we pray for your continued healing in their situation. We pray for your continued presence that they would feel, that they would be strengthened and comforted. Father, we're, we lift up Hyla and Larry and Connie to you. Those that are facing tests this week, we pray that you would calm their anxiety and fear. We pray that they would feel your closeness and know that you are Lord of their life. We pray for positive results in, in, in their tests. We pray for wisdom and understanding amongst those who are, are caring for them, that they would know the right treatments, the right medicines to give. Father, we pray for those who are grieving or depressed, feeling anxious. Lord, we pray that you would calm their spirits, that you would give peace to their minds. Father, we think of family situations that, that are struggling, relationships that might be torn or fractured. We pray for your healing and forgiveness. Father, we ask for your direction in our life that we would look to your spirit to guide us and direct us in the ways that we should go. You are our great and glorious God. Apart from you, we are in trouble. Trying to do things in our own ways only lead to disaster. So bring us close to you. Father, we lift up to you Adrian and the Orbaugh family. Father, we, we pray for your divine intervention. We pray that you would show up in a powerful way that, that would leave, you, leave the doctors baffled and you glorified. We pray that you would bring comfort and, and, and strength to the family as they in, endure this difficult situation. Strengthen their faith, Lord. Strengthen Adrian. And we just lift, we lift them to you. Father, again, thank you for the way that you work in our lives, the way you answer our prayers, the way you are working before we even ask it. You are such a good and faithful God and deserving of all the honor and praise that we can give. So, Lord, we lift this to you in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, 
In preparation for Rob, um, this reading comes from Mark uh, 11, 1 to 10. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his di disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied in a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Thank you for pinch hitting for Cindy. Hope your voice gets better.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this day that we have an opportunity to hear your message and the words that you have for us today. Speak to our souls, challenge our hearts, Lord, that we might be open to the truth of your word, that we may be able to understand it and apply it to our lives. Thank you for coming into our life. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, so for the last few weeks, we've been journeying with Jesus up to this pivotal moment in his life. We walked with him from Galilee to Jericho, where we encountered a, a, a wee little tax collector named Zacchaeus, who had an incredible uh, transformation in his life because of Jesus. Then we walked with him to Bethany, where he grieved with Martha and challenged her to believe in him as the resurrection and the life. And then he did an amazing thing of raising Lazarus from the grave. Then we stayed in Bethany for a special uh, dinner party in Jesus's honor, where Mary knelt in worship, anointing his feet, symbolizing his preparation for his death and his burial. And so now Jesus is finally on his way to Jerusalem, knowing that this would be the culmination of his earthly mission and the beginning of the events that would lead to his sacrificial death and ultimate victory over sin. So as we turn our hearts and minds to the Gospel of Mark, we find ourselves standing, on the, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder next to pilgrims, who thousands of pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast and are now welcoming Jesus. We can almost feel the, the dust rising from the road and the, hearing the shouts of joy and jubilation of the crowd and since the electric anticipation that was filling the air. The triumphal entry was just the beginning of the events that week that would lead to his crucifixion and resurrection. His arrival served a deeper purpose than just a, a parade in, in his honor. It fulfilled ancient prophecies and affirmed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. Through our message this morning, we're going to look at uh, who Jesus is and get a clearer understanding of who he is and find a deeper meaning to what true salvation is and see how we need to allow him to have a triumphal entry into our hearts. So let's turn our attention to our first point, misunderstanding the Messiah. In our passage this morning, we see Jesus riding on a donkey before the shouting crowds as they're waving palm branches in the air and laying their cloaks down in front of him. It's the scene of joy and jubilation. What a day this was. The long-awaited Messiah had come. How their hearts must have pounded in their chest with joy and anticipation for the day that they had been waiting for. And they must have wondered, what's going to happen next? What's he going to do? Is he going to lead an army to, to overthrow the Romans? Will he call down the fires of heaven and consume his enemies? Would he make the Romans pay for their years of oppression of his people? The tension of the moment must have been tremendous. The crowds had excitement and passion, but it wasn't for who Jesus was. It was for who they wanted him to be. The people were welcoming Jesus as a king, but they were thinking of him as an earthly king, not as a heavenly one. They were expecting him to overthrow the Romans and restore Israel to its former glory. But that's not the reason why Jesus came. He didn't come to be a political leader or a military hero. He came to be a savior and not to save them from just the Romans, but from the spiritual bondage of their sin. The people in the crowd didn't understand this. They were hoping for a Messiah that would meet their earthly needs, not their spiritual needs. And when he didn't live up to their expectations, 
many in the crowd abandoned him so quickly that by the end of the week, they were the ones yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And this misunderstanding of who Jesus was wasn't limited to the crowd either. We find that even Jesus' closest followers struggled to understand who he was and why he came. Again, they expected him to establish his earthly kingdom and free Israel from the Roman rule. They couldn't grasp that his kingdom wasn't of this world and that the victory that he would achieve would be over sin and Satan and death. They also couldn't comprehend that this would be accomplished through his horrible suffering and death, even though he had tried to tell them many times before. So when Jesus is arrested and crucified, they were confused and disillusioned. How how could this happen? They had expected him to be a conquering king, not a suffering servant. Like the crowd and the disciples, we struggle sometimes to understand who Jesus is ourselves. We expect him to solve all of our problems, to answer yes to all of our prayers, to make our lives comfortable and simple. And when he does it, then we end up complaining and sometimes even rejecting him, all the while missing the reason why he came, to meet our spiritual needs and to restore us to a right relationship with God. Those are our greatest needs. And Jesus promised us back in Matthew 5, 63, that if we would seek his kingdom above all else, if we would live righteously, that he would give us everything that we need. Not everything that we want, not everything on our, on our shopping list, not everything on, on the, the list that we give Santa at Christmas time, but everything that we need. And we see that in um, yeah we see that in in Matthew seven twenty two where Jesus says many of you well sorry I got messed up in my notes here um, he's under no obligation to to live up to our expectations and meet our needs but he loves us he cares for us he wants the best for us and so he will give you the things that you need, like salvation and eternal life. We also misunderstand what it means to follow Jesus. There are those who lull themselves into a false false sense of security in thinking that if they merely follow a set of rules or if they are just a good person, that that will make them a follower of Christ and they'll be okay. Sadly, it's not. That is a paved road to hell. And that's what Matthew says in in, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 22. Jesus says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't I do great things in your name? And then Jesus will reply, I never knew you away from me. Being obedient is a good thing. Behaving ourselves and treating others with respect is a good thing. But what really matters is us confessing our sins, trusting in him as our savior, and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us and transform us from the inside out. So as we reflect on this passage from Mark, let's ask God to help us to understand who Jesus truly is. Help us to understand why he came. Help us to grasp what it means to be a true follower of Jesus and to be able to adjust our expectations accordingly. And let us live in the light of these truths so that we can experience the fullness of the life that Jesus offers us. Number two, we continue to exam- as we continue to examine the passage of Mark, 
we see that it's not only a scene of jubilation, but also one of deep spiritual significance. The first thing that we noticed is the crowd's reaction to Jesus. They spread their cloaks on the ground and the palm leaves that they, they gather from the fields. This was a gesture of deep respect and honor, a recognition of Jesus's authority. It was an outward expression of their inward belief that Jesus was their Messiah, the one who would come to save them. The spreading of cloaks was a cultural practice and was a sign of submission to a king. And the branches were symbolic as well as they symbolized victory and triumph. By their actions, the crowd is acknowledging Jesus as their victorious king. Yet their understanding of victory was quite different than what Jesus was. They Again, they were expecting a political or military victory, not a spiritual victory over sin and death. This wasn't an earthly triumph. This was a spiritual liberation that had eternal ramifications. And the shouts of joy, the shouts of Hosanna further illustrate that as the word Hosanna in Hebrew means save, please. It was a cry for help, a plea for deliverance. But again, their understanding of deliverance was centered on their current situation. They were acknowledging the one who had the power to save them, but unfortunately they were looking for a temporal deliverance. But Jesus came to bring them an eternal deliverance. So as we consider these truths, we begin to see a, a fuller picture of what salvation is all about. It's not, a, it's not just about deliverance from our earthly troubles, although God does care about those. It's about deliverance from sin and death and about being brought into a right relationship with God. This is the salvation that Jesus came to bring. And just as the crowd responded with acts of honor and cries of praise, so too must we react to Jesus's offer of salvation. We lay our lives down before him just as the crowd laid their cloaks and branches before him. Our response must go beyond just mere outward actions. It must be a response of the heart, a genuine faith in Jesus as our Savior. This is the true manifestation of salvation, a faith that's not just professed with our lips, but lived out in our daily lives. As we consider the triumphal entry, we must turn our gaze inward to see the state of our own hearts. We must ask ourselves the question, have I cried out Hosanna, acknowledging my need to be delivered from sin? Have I allowed Jesus to enter my heart to be the savior and king of my life? Or have I relegated him to the outskirts, a mere visitor with no real authority or influence? In the realm of our hearts, Jesus doesn't desire to just be a mere visitor. He wants to be a resident king. He longs to have a triumphal entry into your heart, a welcome that's filled with joy and reverence and surrender. This is an intentional decision to yield control, to submit to his authority, and to embrace his lordship in every aspect of our life. We must recognize his rightful place in our heart. Jesus is not just a historical figure or a wise teacher. He is the son of God. He's the savior of the world, the king of kings, the lord of lords. His rightful place is on the throne of our hearts, reigning and ruling over our thoughts, our desires, and our actions. By cultivating a relationship with him, we begin to experience a shift in our understanding 
a change in our perspective, and a reordering of our priorities. Just as a king cannot rule effectively if his authority is undermined or his commands ignored, Jesus cannot rule in our hearts if we cling to sin, to self-will, and to worldly distractions. These things must be removed from our our life, not reluctantly or half-heartedly, but willingly and intentionally. And this removal isn't just a one-time event, but a continual process, a daily choice of saying yes to Jesus and no to ourselves. Getting rid of a sin or a habit is, is never easy at first. However, by spending time in his presence, listening to his voice and responding to his leading, he will give us the strength and the ability to do that. And when we open our hearts to his love and open our minds to his truth, we will experience his transforming power. The message of the triumphal entry is a message of a king who came as a lowly servant, not dressed in in royal garb, but riding on a donkey over palm branches and the clothes of the humble and the lowly. He didn't come to conquer by force as earthly kings would, but he came to offer love and grace and mercy. He came to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sin-sick souls. He came to be a sacrifice in place of us for our sins. So let us make room in our hearts. Let us welcome him as our king. Remove anything that hinders his rule and cultivate a relationship with him. Let us not just hear about the triumphal entry, but experience it in our hearts today. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the way that you have triumphed over sin. With joy and celebration, we we welcome you into our hearts. Fill us with your love and your mercy and your grace. Lord, we cry Hosanna to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand for our closing hymn, The Old Rugged Cross.
come in, live the way that he directs you to live. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I saw 